Okay, so without looking at the slides, if you will, um, what were the conditions that allowed that? So what, what was that? What was happening there? What happened? I, I think people started to, to take smaller steps when they moved, the further we went through it. Okay. Actually, it disrupted your time each time left. That's interesting. So the system was zeroing in on the end state. Yeah. Yeah? If I'd appointed somebody, the project manager and a team of helpers and a team of doers, and asked you to structure that according to my requirements as the customer in the same kind of way, how long would that have taken? <laughs> a, a lot longer, yeah. So what conditions allowed that to be a beautifully self-organizing system? Silence. Silence? Yeah. Everyone, knew what they were, everyone knew what they were aiming for. Everyone knew what they were aiming for? Yes, did you ever? Uh, clear instructions. Yeah, you knew, you knew what the what the rules were. So you were in control yourself? You, you, you could control yourself into where you... You had complete control over where you were, uh, notwithstanding other people to bump into. Just because there weren't instructions. You were really focused on the task. Great, yep. Really clear feedback. You could see exactly what was happening. Immediately clear feedback. Yeah, there's lots of observing and then yeah. responding kind of slowly rather than rushing. Yeah. Yep. And, and I use that to contrast that with the not, right? Um, which is the s state we start in. Was that a self organizing system? No. No. No, sorry. Was this just what we did just now, a self organizing system? Thank you. Was it? Yes. I mean, the answer is yes and no, because I organised the system. <laughs> um, so the point is, you start in a knot, but as commissioners, you have the opportunity to try to design the conditions of the system to allow it to be self-organising in this way. And what you talked about, that design of the culture within the in-house service, was a quite nice example of that. Yeah? Um, and uh, so uh, this is uh, a guy called Nick Oblensky. Um, He's identified this set of four freedoms, underlying uh, purpose, people's skill and will, a tolerance to ambiguity and freedom to act, and four restraints, limitations, right? Clear objectives, a few simple rules, clear feedback, and very clear boundaries. If I'd allowed you to move anywhere around the building on different floors, goodness knows what would have happened, right? Um, and I've added in the extra rule, because I've noticed now that some people wait until the end, and then they put themselves into position, and everybody goes, ah, oh. and, then, and then the person is waiting again, and then they go into position, and then it, so you have to synchronise. You have to be synchronised in, in your movement, okay? So the possibilities of organisation, if you get the soft freedoms and the hard constraints right, are that you can create a self-organising, mutually supportive system. But if you don't do that, you as the leader will reap the pain of setting people off with a lack of clarity and a failure to deliver results becomes a negative self-fulfilling feedback. Okay? So in your commissioning systems, you're going to start with something like a knot, almost always, with something like the elephant, where everybody's having a different and a contradictory experience of the overall situation. Um, and the, what you're trying to do as architects of a system is move as much as possible to have that clarity of freedoms and constraints that allows people to self-organise with a clear goal, with clear feedback. But the constraints are an important part of the, you can't, if, you, if I just said organise yourselves, I would never get to the result that I was looking for. Is, is that fair? So hopefully those two little experiential bits I know we're coming up to, to, to three o'clock, um, uh, are useful in thinking about the two possible states and how you can try and untangle and align uh, both of them. And finally, um, you never understand a system until you start to try to change it because the world pushes back on you. Things change uh, as you go. So the possibility if you're intervening in your systems through this kind of intervention, through cultural changes, and through different ways of uh, commissioning and different ways of focusing on the outcomes, um, is to move, sorry, this has got slightly, uh, something's gone slightly wrong with it, but the, the point is there are three levels of learning that are available to you. One level of learning is how to do the same thing better, right? How to commission or how to fill in a pothole 
um, and make sure that it actually gets it stays filled in. Yep. The second level of learning is changing our thinking about the problem. So maybe instead of filling in potholes, what we're doing is we're resurfacing the road before the potholes mostly emerge because we've, we've got a planned thing, and we understand road deterioration, we understand the use, and we've understood the system a bit better. Yep. But transforming our role and changing our perceptions is at the next level. Maybe our job is not to repair potholes or to ensure that the road surface is good, but to move people away from forms of vehicles that are damaging the road surface in the first place, for the sake of argument, right? And that's possible. We're working with the states of Guernsey. Sadly, they cancelled tomorrow because of the snow. But they, you know, they've got all kinds of vehicles. You're not allowed to go faster than 35 miles an hour on the island, right? They'd be a classic prototype site to have all electric vehicles, all light vehicles. They would hardly ever need to do road resurfacing ever again. Um, if they were able to move to that state. So remember, it's a hoary old thing now, it's a cliche, but the world's biggest transport company doesn't own any vehicles, that's Uber. The world's biggest accommodation company doesn't own uh, any accommodation, that's Airbnb. That's an example of second or probably third order learning about how to redefine the system. So most of the time, the question is, how do we repair the roads better? Simon has brought us a great example where it's at least getting to that second order question of, um, it looks as though we've got good roads and yet the people are not happy. How can we use the roads to help the people be happy? Right, or possibly to help win the next election, uh, those sceptical amongst us might say. But it's still a different order of question, isn't it? But it takes you away from the certainty of the technical into the uncertainty of the complex and the social and you have to then start to think how can we build a system that actually will keep people happy without undermining the happiness and the uh, smooth order of society somewhere else. So it gets us into a really interesting complex challenge.